My name is David Dingley. I'm a consultant in the Division of Hematology and in the, in the Transplant Center at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today I would like to talk with you about multiple myeloma and the role of autologous stem cell transplantation as part of the treatment plan for this disease. Multiple myeloma is a tumor of, the, of plasma cells that normally reside in the bone marrow. It's a fairly common uh, malignancy uh, and the Mayo Clinic has had a long-standing interest in diagnosis and therapy for this disease. The disease can present in a variety of ways, but uh, typically it's associated with bone pain, a uh, risk of kidney injury, sometimes patients have renal failure, a uh, high calcium level that can cause problems such as confusion, constipation, nausea, vomiting, and anemia. Most patients uh, will be diagnosed because of symptoms, but increasingly patients are being diagnosed uh, at a fairly asymptomatic state. Many of these patients still require therapy. There has been a sea change in the diagnosis and therapy of this disease over the last 15 years with the development of exciting, new, and highly effective therapies for this disease. In fact, the prognosis for this disease has been increasing exponentially over the last few years. The disease, as I mentioned, is quite diverse, and therefore a one-size-fits-all approach is not appropriate for patients, especially with, with novel technologies when we aim for personalized therapy that is tailored for the individual patient. It is essential that patients diagnosed with this disease are seen at a center of excellence as quickly as possible so that therapy can be tailored for their current situation. Critical at the time of diagnosis are the presence of recurrent and specific chromosomal abnormalities that can help the treating physician plan appropriate therapy. We believe that patients should be given therapy that depends on the risk of progression and taking into consideration their other comorbidities. This is quite important because the average age of diagnosis of multiple myeloma is in the 70s and many, many times patients have associated comorbidities that can make a choice of, of the appropriate therapy difficult. Autologous stem cell transplant is not curative for multiple myeloma, but it's an important component of therapy because it often can lead to deep responses that can persist for quite a period of time. The autologous stem cell transplant needs to be carefully planned, and it's important that patients who receive induction therapy do not receive any agent that can potentially compromise therapy with stem cell transplantation. This is why it is important that they are seen very early in the course of their disease. The main risks associated with autologous stem cell transplant are those related to fever and infection, risk of injury to the lining of the gut, something which we term mucositis. There is a small risk of induction of heart rhythm problems, damage to the kidneys, and then ultra small risk of that from the transplant. I would like to address these in turn. Early on after transplant, as I mentioned, patients generally feel well. The most common symptoms early on can be some nausea and vomiting, but nowadays we have excellent drugs that generally control symptoms very well. Starting, say, five days after transplant, we, we notice that the blood counts start going down as the bone marrow is feeling the brunt of the chemotherapy that we have given. Usually at that time, patients start feeling a little bit more tired, but they often can remain quite ambulatory, and a number of them continue to exercise. As the blood counts fall, there is a risk of infection, there is a risk of bleeding. Patients will be routinely on antibiotics to try and prevent infection as much as possible. But approximately 90-95% of patients will develop a fever after transplant. At that time, one has to assume that there is an infection, and we evaluate the patient regardless of the time of day or night, and we screen for infection, and then we start intravenous antibiotics. If patients are stable, they can stay as an outpatient and return to the hospital as, as many times as necessary, usually twice a day, to continue with their antibiotics. 
And then, depending on what, what the uh, cultures show, we can tailor antibiotic therapy. In most situations, the fever resolves in about two to three days. The bone marrow starts recovering approximately 12, 13 days after transplant, give or take a few days. And as the bone marrow recovers, then the risk of infection goes down. When the patient is, is anemic and with low platelets, of course, there's a risk of bleeding. There are symptoms such as shortness of breath and induction of rhythm problems in the heart. So it's very common that patients after transplant require transfusions with red cells and platelets. And uh, these decisions are made on a day-to-day -day basis. Another complication of transplant is this injury, which we call mucositis. And this is an injury that affects the lining of the gut. The reason for this injury is that the chemotherapy that is used cannot discriminate between the bad cells and good cells. And because the lining of the gut has many rapidly dividing cells, it often bears quite a bit of the brunt from the chemotherapy. For reasons that are not clear, not every patient develops this problem. And this, when it occurs, it can vary in severity from mild discomfort in the throat or in the gullet after swallowing to more severe pain that may require the use of powerful pain medicines and sometimes even admission to hospital for pain control. If it affects the bowel, then it typically causes considerable diarrhea and cramping. Again, these symptoms can be controlled. The, the, this mucositis generally heals at the same time as the bone marrow, and usually it has no long-term consequences on patients. With the transplant, as a, res a result of these problems I've mentioned, infections, heart rhythm problems, mucositis, there's a small risk that we, uh, there can be an injury to the kidney that sometimes require intermittent or perhaps even long-term dialysis. This risk is quite low. There's a risk that with infections, the patients can become quite critically ill, requiring a stay in the intensive care unit. But again, that risk is generally low. One cannot talk about stem cell transplantation without acknowledging that there's a small risk that the patient may die, a result of these complications I've mentioned. In our experience, the transplant rate in mortality is around 0.4%, which means that in the last two years, we've had one or two deaths at most. Of course, these statistics are true because of our multidisciplinary approach to therapy, very aggressive follow-up of patients, and because of the combined expertise of the physicians, the critical care service, nephrologists, cardiologists, and our nurse practitioners who vigilantly take care of these patients. Most of our patients are ready to go home approximately 20 days after transplant. At that time, patients continue with their recovery at home. Usually the risk of infections is relatively low, and it is unusual that patients run into problems after they are dismissed. Then patients are typically seen 70 or 100 days after transplant, depending on their specific disease characteristics so that one can assess the response to transplant and one can make decisions on whether patients require maintenance therapy. Transplant is not the be-all or end-all in myeloma, but many patients benefit immensely from the transplant. Although the treatment is evolving, we still believe that there are patients who after autologous stem cell transplant may not require any myeloma-specific therapy and they may have two years or more where no therapy is needed. And of course, this has to be factored in as an important quality of life issue, not to mention uh, the expense. There are patients who after transplant probably benefit from maintenance therapy or additional chemotherapy. But decisions on this are made on a patient by patient basis. And as I mentioned up front, a one size fits all approach for multiple myeloma is not appropriate in this day and age.